today's NEMO webinar. We're very excited. All right, as I'm getting myself set here, we are going to begin since we are at the top of the hour. One more moment while I get myself set up. Welcome everybody to today's NASA ARIES webinar session. My name is Paige Valderrama Graf and I'm the lead facilitator for today's session. Rosina Miller is monitoring the chat window to help you with any issues you may have along the way. I'm really excited to have all of you here with us today. We have groups of students from all across the nation, from Arizona to Pennsylvania to Illinois to North Dakota, Florida, Nevada, North Carolina, and our own home state of Texas, which we are broadcasting from. So we are at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Welcome, and we hope you enjoy today's session. To turn things over, I'm gonna let uh, Trevor Graff, who's our speaker today, introduce a little bit about himself and then talk to us about today's topic, NASA NEMO. Trevor, thanks for joining us today and take it away. Great, thanks Paige, and thanks everybody for calling in today. Um, if there's one thing that I love to talk about, it's the NEMO mission. Um, myself, again, Paige said, I'm Trevor Graff, I'm the Jacobs Chief Scientist here at NASA JSC. Um, and my background, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, went to school in Arizona and Pennsylvania before finding myself here at JSC, um, working in a lot of rules. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work on the rovers on Mars. You see the picture there. Um, have great opportunities to work on those missions, other missions here at JSC, and absolutely love NEMO. And I've been involved in NEMO now for three years as the chief scientist for NEMO as well. And I'd love to talk about it and hopefully share that with you here today. For those that may not know, NEMO stands for, is an acronym that stands for NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations. It occurs off in Florida, and I will show you, uh, take you through the who, what, when, where kind of NEMO as we go through these slides and even take you on a virtual dive to the habitat. So what is NEMO? Uh, NEMO is now this mission, we've, we've had 21 all the way back since 2001, we've done 21 of these space exploration simulations, um, which we call NEMO. And what we do is we take groups of astronauts, so astronauts here at JSC, engineers from uh, across the globe and scientists, and we send them to live and work in a really challenging environment. And that challenging environment for us is under the sea. So um, very much like space, you know, the humans are uh, need environmental controls and systems and things to keep them alive, just like space, same kind of situation underwater. Um, and that's what makes it such a great simulation for astronauts and engineers and scientists to work together. So you see some pictures here of people drilling and doing sampling, um, people using electronics and, and cue cards underwater and doing great science, which I'll talk about here in the, in the next few slides. We've had the opportunity to have great people involved. Uh, the picture to the, lower, to the lower right shows the crew from last year. And you can see the mission patches along there. Um, great international crew with the United States, South Africa, and Germany, um, and other, other countries involved. And so it's a great way to meet people and broad sets of experience. This slide's a little busy, but just gives you the heritage and background of how NEMO fits in the broader picture. Um, so you see in this blue arrow here, the NEMO uh, missions, like I said, starting all the way back to 2001. And every little icon here shows you the NEMO missions along the way, um, up, leading up to that last one we conducted in 2016, and we're planning already for 2017, so I'll let you know a little bit about that near the end. We draw a lot of our heritage and background from things that were done on the lunar surface back in the 1970s when we went to the, the lunar surface. We also learn a lot from the robotic missions that we do on Mars. Like I said, we have, you know, rovers on Mars ever since, uh, you know, the, the 2000s that I've been involved in, and we have rovers on Mars today. We, we learn a lot from that robotic operations, and we incorporate that in the types of things we do at NEMO. And then all the other studies that go on here at Mar or at JSC and um, with other participants within NASA, 
doing different stimulations, we, we gather that all up and we incorporate that in the mission operations at NEMO. Who does NEMO? Well, it's a small, dedicated group of people. Um, you see two pictures here that uh, to the left and the right are NEMO 20 and NEMO 21 over on the right-hand side. Um, great, absolute group of people, dedicated folks that have a broad sense of experience, the scientists, engineers, Navy divers, and then, you know, our core people that we train, the astronauts. And our astronauts come from ESA, from JAXA, from Canada, so great international partnerships, as I said. And then we have people participating across, you know, the United States and internationally from industry and, and academia, so schools and universities, and you see some of the logos there um, down below. Uh, a few, Shark Marine is a great organization that brings robot, robotics for us to use, um, so we have, we have some ROVs or some robotic um, of vehicles that we use with NEMO. Um, Honeybee Robotic is built, Robotics has built things for those NASA rovers. They're, they're involved, the Navy, and, and on and on and on. Um, and I'll talk about the Coral Restoration Foundation here coming up, a great organization based out of the Florida Keys. Next slide. So a little bit more about the WHO and the, our astronaut aquanauts. So once a person lives in the habitat for 24 hours, they become officially what's known as an aquanaut. Um, and so we've had 50, up to date, we've had 50 astronaut aquanauts. So those are people that have both flown in space and lived on the seafloor for over 24 hours. You see the list of them here. 49 of them have done it in what is known as the Aquarius habitat. Um, and that's what I'll talk about, you know, what all the NEMO missions have occurred in is the Aquarius habitat. Except for one, and that very first one was Scott Carpenter, pictured down in the lower right. You can see Scott Carpenter. Back in the 1960s, early 1960s, Scott Carpenter was one of the original seven astronauts for NASA. He was the first person in a program called Sea Lab to live under the ocean for 30 days and become the original astronaut aquanaut. Ever since then, starting with NEMO 1, so all the numbers below or beside people's names, are all the NEMO missions and the astronauts that have been involved in them. So great group of people. we are now hit that magic mark of 50 of people both flown in space and lived on the seafloor. Where is NEMO? Well, NEMO occurs, as I said, the Aquarius Reef Base. So it's this habitat that sits on the seafloor at about 60 feet, you know, the sand down here is about 60 feet of ocean water above it, and the habitat is located about five miles or about 10 kilometers or so off of Key Largo in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, it lives in a place called Conch Reef, and it's operated by the Florida International University. Um, so what it is is it's this 10-foot circular, basically you could think of it as a, as a submarine. It's about 10 foot around and about 40 to 50 feet long. There, up on top of the surface is this yellow thing pictured on the lower right called a LSB or a life support buoy. That's where the generators are, that's where the, 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 the power comes from, and what connects that life support buoy to the habitat is a, is a cable that's about four inches wide, and all the air, all the power, all the data, everything gets transported back and forth through that cable. The habitat's where the, the crew lives for anywhere from a week to two weeks, and you can see some of the things picture of what the habitat looks inside, but we'll get a closer look at that here shortly. What I want to do is take you on a dive to Aquarius. So we're going to start out from a boat called the George F. Bond, named after one of the pioneers of saturation diving um, from the Navy's back when, I was, when Scott Carpenter was involved. Um, so we're going to dive from this boat. You can see that LSB I talked about that's supplying power and, and energy and data comms and everything from the from the top of the ocean down to the habitat. So let's take that dive. And as we do that, 
what I want you to do is put your observations in the chat window. So go ahead and, and chat the types of observations you see, and this video is a couple minutes long, so go ahead and take that time and, and put what your observations are. Let's get started on our dive. Mm -hmm, okay. Here we go. We're going to start making our way over towards Aquarius. Remember to go ahead and put in the chat window the types of things you see along the way. Whether you know what they are or not. If you hear us, that, that noise, that hum, we use some underwater scooters that get us around the, the sea floor faster. Um, and that's what that hum is as we go towards the quarry. All right, maybe you can start to see some things coming up here. seeing some great observations coming in, but we're going to let you keep on listening and, and we'll, we'll comment on some of these uh, once the video is complete. Now we've got Aquarius in our full view. Again, that's about 50 foot long from end to end. Great. So hopefully you enjoyed that dive. Uh, there's some great observations coming along. Yeah, everybody looks like they saw that lionfish at the end from Chester High School. Um, and so along that way, we saw some things and you guys made great observations. Uh, looks like a few people spotted that stingrays that went by, the eagle rays. Um, those are amazing creatures underwater. Uh, they opportunistic on that dive, saw them along the way. You don't see them that often there. So you guys had a, a unique treat to see those stingrays in the video. Uh, we also saw a lot of equipment down there. So those are that's the equipment that we used during the NEMO mission. And then as we made our way up to Aquarius, you saw a lot of the stuff that keeps that habitat um, operational on the sea floor. And so there's a lot of tanks, there's a lot of uh, facility things that we'll get into uh, as we take a walk around the, the Aquarius habitat here in just a second. But great observations. And uh, let's move on to hit the hit cancel, cancel and go to next. There you go. Okay, so now that we've made our way to Aquarius on our dive, in the chat window, again, can you guys put some things, some facilities that you would expect to have inside that habitat? What types of things do you expect for people living underwater for a week or two weeks to have to have in that habitat? Um, so go ahead and throw some of your observations in the chat window. So again, as you start to put in some of those facilities, we're gonna read them off to see what types of answers we get. What do you expect to have in an underwater habitat? Let's see what comes in. I saw from Pleasant Valley Elementary, the, the missions for, for NEMO are about two months long, or sorry, two weeks long. Some, some are a little shorter, but the maximum we've done is about two weeks. 
And we're seeing Pleasant Valley Elementary saying you're going to need oxygen, a garden, water filter down there. Fifth grade Anasazi Elementary is mentioning tools to measure water pressure and a way to deliver supplies, an oxygen source, oxygen monitor. Chester High School is saying food and a restroom. Immaculate Conception Catholic School is saying labs, fresh water, a bathroom, food, beds, oxygen, cameras. Chester High School is adding in that there would be a need for some monitors or there would probably be some monitors in that underwater habitat. We'll see if there's anything else that comes in. We'll give it a couple of more seconds here. Some great uh, observations, though, and thoughts coming in, though, so far. Let's see if there's anything else. Food, restrooms, fresh water, food, beds, oxygen, cameras, even potentially a garden. I'm not sure, and we'll, we'll get a view of this. Uh, and an energy source from Immaculate Conception and, and some light since you're at almost 60 feet underwater. So Trevor, some interesting, uh, interesting items that, and facilities that the groups have identified. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Spot on on some of those. We definitely need the things that, you know, the creature comforts, the bathrooms and, and the beds and stuff, which we'll see here in a second. And you're absolutely right on the monitors and the lights and the energy sources and the cameras. There's a lot packed inside the Aquarius habitat. Uh, again, an amazing facility and one of the only ones, uh, now it's the only um, underwater habitat in the world. So let's take a look inside that unique place and let's get set up here to do that. Now that we've made our way down to it, let's peek inside. If we can get ourselves there, sorry Trevor. Okay, so what I'm going to do, if you can see this map, you can see Florida. I mentioned that the Aquarius habitat lives off the Florida Keys. So let's zoom down to the Florida Keys, where it lives about five miles off of Key Largo. So you see Key Largo here and Plantation Key. And this is that conch reef that I talked about. And you can see Aquarius Reef Base labeled there. So as we zoom down, you can see where it lives off the fringe of the reef. And I'm going to click on Aquarius Reef Base, and we can take a look at it in 360 view. So now we see what that looks like from outside, but let's take a look inside. So now we're inside, and you guys made some great observations that you need bunks, right? You need some place to sleep. And so let's take a 360 view around of the bunk room. So that's the first place we went in. Um, so you can see a diver looking into the bunk room and a view poured out. So a great way to wake up in the morning is to look out and see what the marine life is doing out there. So the Aquarius Reef Base will sleep up to six people, and you can see how they're kind of stacked up inside there. So that's the bunk room, and you guys made great observation of, of what that, of the need of having a bunk room like that. So now let's move into what's known as the main locker. So in here, like you guys said, you know, we need a lot of monitoring system. You, got, you do this type of stuff, you need to know what oxygen levels you have, what carbon dioxide levels, all that sort of things. And you can see the panels that are required. Much like a spacecraft, you have to monitor all the things around you and you can see there's a lot of panels, a lot of things to make sure that everybody's safe and that the operation goes smoothly. We have lights great light system, small refrigerator. So there's the refrigerator and that's, you know, crew of six living down there for up to two weeks it has to be very, you know, um, very efficient on what you take down there. Here's the crew table. So this is where people live and work and eat right here at the crew table, seat six, nice and comfortably. And then you've got your small little kitchen or your galley. Uh, again, we've got a diver looking in through the main port window. And there's little workstations like you see here with the bench. Now let's walk a little bit further that direction. And now we're inside what's known as the entry hab. So there's that bathroom that everybody was pointing out, made great observation, you need something there. So there's a little uh, bathroom. Another work area where we set up all our equipment for NEMO. Um, so this, during a NEMO operation, gets populated with a lot of equipment. More dials, more controls, more 
comms equipment, so for communication to the top side. Um, so a lot of that inside, packed inside. And now the way that the crew goes and does what we know as an EVA, or extravehicular activity, so the way that you go out and dive in the water while you're in Aquarius, oops, got back up here. Hang on one second, we're already in the water. Is through this thing called the wet porch. So you go in here, more, more dials, more gauges, you go in through this pool. So all you got to do to get into the water is step into this pool. I think somebody made a com uh, observation in the chat window of how the things get down there. Well, they get down there through these big metal pots. So you store, you put all your stuff when you're on the boat in these pots, and those are swam down, brought into the wet porch, and put here, and you bring all your equipment out. So everything that goes from the, from the surface to the hab goes down in these pots. And so we can go back through and out the hab and look around at some of the things that we saw as we took our virtual dive or our dive down to Aquarius. Absolutely amazing facility. And the one thing I will point out once we're back outside is it's becoming a part of the reef itself. You can see all the growth that is now becoming part of the reef and the, and the fish love it. The fish love to, to hide at, around Aquarius and to use it as part of the, the, the reef that it's becoming. And there's that window that we took our dive to and we're, we're looking into um, when we got the wave from, from Megan in there. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why, why NEMO is so important and the Aquarius reef base is so important for the for space flight. And that's because, as I alluded to earlier, it's such a convincing analog for space, space exploration. It's an extreme environment. You know, people aren't, aren't suited to, to just go out in the water and, you know, live and work for a long time. They need a lot of equipment that keeps them safe. Um, and a habitat like this is very much like the International Space Center or a habitat that we may envision one day going to the moon surface or onto Mars. It's also a great place down at the bottom, you can see, for integrated operations, what we know as integrated operations, where you have scientists talking to people to do an operations, talking to people that build equipment, and all vice versa. So having this integrated group of people that I showed you on those boats earlier from this diverse skill sets, people that engineering backgrounds, science backgrounds, all working and living together and talking to each other to learn from each other. That's what we mean by integrated operations. I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about the science because, like I said, this is the part that I lead for, for NEMO. And we do two big types of science. One is the reef exploration. So we send these aquanauts out through that wet porch to go explore the reef around them. They do all kinds of sampling. Um, they do all kinds of interesting studies to learn about the reef around Aquarius and how it is and how it's developing. And there's three endangered species specifically that are shown down here in the bottom right that we study, Sidorastria, Agaricea, and Orbicella. Um, so we're studying those over the past three years in order to see how they do um, in the, how they are surviving in the Keys. And all this is communicated to a science team that's topside or back on shore that tells them what they do, how to do it, and, you know, they communicate all that data back and forth. So the science team is very critical. The other component that we did last year for the first time in collaboration with that Coral Restoration Foundation I talked about is we built nurseries in order to grow coral. And I know some people may think that's kind of weird, but it absolutely can be done and I'll show you in the next few slides of how we did that. So the first, you've got to start, you've got to prepare, process, and train the crew in order to do it. So here we see, you know, they, certain coral pieces break off during storms, and you can go collect those, and then you can subsec, make subsections of those corals to be able to take back out on the reef and grow them. So you see here, we're preparing those in a facility in the Keys, we're training the crew on how to how to build these these trees that I will talk about, and then actually 
taking the coral out there to grow them out on the reef. Now, much like we did during the Apollo space flight days or even other space missions, we have to transport stuff and we have to build. So we built these trees that you see here, the aquanauts building the trees after transporting all this equipment to the site. And then we do that science operation where that science teams are talking to them and you can see here them using instruments in order to study those corals that are growing. And immediately after you build these trees, you get sea life to come and check them out. So here you see a curious turtle coming to check out the trees that we just built. And here's what that coral looks like. Eventually this coral starts to grow out over the card and then you can cut this card up into five, six, seven pieces and then take those little pieces and plant them out on the reef and they'll start to grow. And so now you took one piece of coral and now you have 10 pieces of coral and it just goes on and on. So with that in mind, how, how, here's another question for you guys to put in the chat window. How much do you think a coral grows each year? Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Stick it in the chat window and uh, we'll, we'll discuss it here in just a minute. So think about it, discuss it, and how much do you think a coral grows in a year? We'll see what comes in. Standing by. So Lynn Haven in Florida says answers of 2 to 25 inches in a year. Anasazi Elementary says 10 inches or maybe 100 pounds in terms of a, 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 a mass or a weight. JCTMS is thinking only two inches. Northern Cass says maybe three inches. Pleasant Valley Elementary says maybe about one inch a year or so. Now, Immaculate Conception Catholic School thinks possibly a foot of growth in a year. Chester High School goes back to our inch levels of five to seven inches. So the majority of what I'm seeing, Trevor, is People are, are, are thinking maybe in the order of inches up to a foot for how much a coral may grow in a year. Well, I hope you're gonna give us an answer to this. <laughs> I sure will, and you guys are spot on. I mean, it's, it's in that range, and let's take a look. So here's staghorn coral on the left-hand side, and you can see them on those trees that are built at these nurseries. And you can see they go from a couple inches as the starting material to branching out. So there's no like one answer of how many inches because they really start branching out and making multiple pieces. But it's order of a, you know, a couple inches per year as these things branch out. Um, and so those are grown on the trees and then you take this and you break it up into smaller pieces again and you plant them out on the coral reef itself. So here's some elkhorn coral that you can see these tiny little pieces that are planted out on the reef, so to populate the reef again with corals that have been, um, you know, no longer there. And you see this started in 2001. This is, oh, sorry, 2011. This is what they look like two years after, so, you know, grown many inches. 2014, where they start to grow bigger and bigger, and now the sea life comes in. And then 2015, where they've grown pretty good-sized coral that now can support um, the reef and the fish and so that's in a matter of four years has grown into a really healthy coral, and that surprises a lot of people that coral can grow that fast. So very good answers, very good observations, and a very interesting project that we've got involved now in NEMO in, in helping the coral reefs regrow and study this. So one of the questions we're interested in at NEMO is, do the coral grow faster in deeper water where the aquanauts can go or shallower water? And so those are all the types of study questions that we're working on and helping um, our researchers. Now, I talked a little bit about this. This is the planetary science relevance. So, you know, obviously we're not going to other planets like the moon or Mars to study coral, but what it allows us to do at NEMO when we incorporate all this interesting science, it allows us to sample the coral, the same type of sampling procedures that we would do on Mars or the moon. So, you know, we've got to be very cautious on how we sample them so they're, they're correct for science and we can do DNA sequencing and all kinds of sampling techniques, collection of the tools and contamination, like I said, how do you stow and transport equipment? All very interesting questions from 
from my perspective, working here at NASA, you know, within the Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division, um, those are the things we're interested in, and the, the marine science is a great proxy for that. So it's a great analog for what we're doing um, and thinking about for planetary surfaces. You can see we also have a research wing that thinks about remote sensing and how to select these samples and how to document these samples, all very interesting questions that we tackle at NEMO and have planetary context um, whenever we do go to a planetary surface um, with humans. So very much um, relevant, the things we have incorporated into NEMO is what NASA is interested in. Now everything I've talked about so far has been everything that we've done outside the HAB, all the science we've done outside the HAB. But we do a lot of inside activities too, which are called intervehicular activities or IVA activities. Um, there's things like exercises devices. So you see this miniature exercise device that um, one of the Navy guys is using here. Um, that device right now is on the International Space Center. So we tested it first at NEMO and then learned a lot of lessons, and now that device is now being used on the International Space Center. One of the things that I think is really cool is this HoloLens here. That's a virtual reality goggles that allow the crew to be more efficient, and so we're testing them now. A pair of these, again, is on the International Space Center and being used. So we test a lot of things that um, before they fly inside the HAB, because, it, you know, like I said, the HAB is very much like a space module, um, and a whole host of things. The last one I'll point out, although there's many more, is the mini miniature DNA sequencing. We've actually, for the very first time last mission, sequenced DNA in, in the habitat. So it's the very first time DNA has been sequenced underwater in the habitat, and then not more than two months later, they did the same thing on the ISS using the procedures and the thoughts and the lessons learned from NEMO. So very cool things that happen inside the habitat as well. Wrapping up here, I just wanted to show a few pictures of the life above and below um, NEMO. Very great um, crew and operations and I can't say enough that the, the biggest thing that I take away from NEMO, even all the diving's cool and all the equipment's cool, the biggest thing I, my takeaway is, is learning from all these people with diverse skill sets. It's great to learn from engineers and other scientists and, you know, technicians and the dive operations. It's just fabulous people. Um, one of the things I'll touch on here is this picture on the upper right. So we talked about how you go down. You go just swim down to the habitat and you pop in. Well, when you come back up, you have to go through a special protocol called um, uh, DECO as you come back up to the surface. And so you pressurize that habitat back to the surface and are able to come back and share all the lessons learned of the mission. So this is the crew from NEMO 21 going through DECO, and you can see them in those six bunks that we talked about. Um, fabulous mission. This is Mission Control Center here, so you can see it's staffed by a lot of great people. Again, great skill sets and great people to learn from. I talked about when um, we are planning for NEMO 22. It's coming up really soon in June. Hopefully you guys can follow along. There's a number of avenues to do that with. There's um, the NEMO webpage, so you can go to the NEMO webpage. There's also the Aquarius web page, so that's the facility or the habitat web page, and they actually have, you can see down here, you can watch live um, during the mission. You can see some of the camera views and actually watch live via the Aquarius web page. And then we also have a bunch of social media um, that you can follow along on NASA underscore NEMO, Facebook, Twitter. We'll be posting a lot of pictures from that mission coming up in June, so hopefully you guys have the opportunity to follow along this summer and uh, really looking forward to this mission coming up. We've got even more great science, new crew coming in that's going to, you know, be trained here very shortly and conduct NEMO 22. And one thing I'll also mention is for those of you teachers out there, you might have given me uh, your contact information sometime during the summer because we may try to connect with 
an aquanaut live from the Aquarius Reef Base in June. We're still trying to work out some of those details, but that would be pretty exciting to be able to connect with someone live from the actual habitat. So stay tuned for that. Now with that, I want to say first of all, thank you, Trevor, for sharing your knowledge, passion, and expertise about NEMO. Trevor is an extremely busy scientist who's always working on a variety of projects, and currently NEMO is one of those. So having him take the time to be able to virtually take us there and share some of the science that we've done uh, as part of the NEMO mission, thank you very much, Trevor, for taking the time to share this with us. For those of you on the line still, you may have some questions that at this time we want to be able to share uh, or we want to be able to answer. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share our camera. This does not mean that we want everyone uh, to, uh, to share their cameras because bandwidth-wise that would just be a little bit too cumbersome. But I want you to be able to see Trevor. So we're going to share at least Trevor with you here. And here I am as well. Yes. Uh, so I know Trevor as now for schools on the line, put your questions into the chat window. I do have one question that came in from Northern Cass, which is our school in North Dakota. And they are wondering, Trevor, how do you prevent corrosion of the lab or any of the equipment? Uh, great question. It's an ongoing problem, is it? So. Uh, the hab itself is made out of stainless steel, which is pretty corrosion resistant. And so just like a submarine, it's made from an actual submarine company that built the hab. Um, but all the things like the valves that need to be turned and uh, all that that's outside the habitat, you might have saw whenever we did that, that virtual tour around the habitat, those have to be constantly cleaned. So every week or so, they'll send divers down with, with wire brushes to clean off those the different things that need to be moved and, and, and turned. But largely the HAB is pretty self-sufficient because it's made from, you know, basically like a submarine. Um, and some of it you just let grow into the natural coral that grows on it and you don't need to worry about it. So absolutely great question. Some of the stuff takes a lot of work, but some of it you just let um, become part of the natural reef. Awesome, and that was a very interesting and great question. Here's another one from Immaculate Conception Catholic School right here in Texas. They're wondering, do you have to wear oxygen masks when you sleep? Uh, only for a short period of time during that deco period where you're coming back up. So no, not, not during the normal mission, but at the very end where you, you, you go through an oxygen protocol where you wear it for maybe an hour or two at the very end, um, and that's a, during the protocol coming back to the surface, um, only for a short period of time. Great question. Now, here's a really interesting question from Pleasant Valley Elementary, and they're in Nevada. And I'm assuming that they're thinking about doing a project like this in class, maybe with, uh, with corals, and um, uh, at least I'm assuming this is with corals, and they're wondering what types of materials might you suggest? They're thinking of several aquariums or what, what can you suggest? And I'm, I'm making an assumption that they're, if they were to do a project like this in class, a project related to maybe growing corals. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, aquarium industry out there, maybe a, a great one to tap into where you can make an, a, a reef tank. There's a lot of people that love to, to set up a reef tank and you can watch soft coral and maybe some hard coral grow inside your reef tank. So you could set up a tank in your in your classroom or, you know, wherever, and you have to keep up with it because there are a lot of work to, to, to make sure the water chemistry is right. Um, but you can do a beautiful reef tank and, and observe that of how fast things grow, very similar to what we do um, out on the reef chemo. So that would maybe be a great project to set something like that up. Awesome. And I'm sure the, the, the um, chemistry of the water would play a really important role in being able to have those corals be able to grow or survive. It sounds like a great science fair project. Yeah, too. absolutely. And then you have to keep up with, you know, so there's a symbiotic relationship between the, the, the animals that you put in there. So you, you may have to put some fish in there that, that clean, you know, 
or help clean the tank or help the, the corals grow. And that's what we find out on the reef is that, you know, things are very symbiotic so that one thing depends on the other thing. So those are things that you would have to learn along the way and um, reach out for expertise or, or read about it and uh, make sure that everything is well suited and study that as part of a project, which sounds like a great project. And related to that, although um, some, some other folks are thinking about projects like this, the Coral Restoration Foundation, which has started building these coral trees, is there a way that got started? Did they even know it would work? Can you explain even how they may have started and how much that has grown, uh, whether it's beyond the keys or, or, or anything like that? Yeah. That's a really fascinating organization. It's a nonprofit run out of the Florida Keys by a gentleman named Ken Niedemeyer, who's a really great guy to work with. He had this idea, of, you know, a couple years back, maybe 10 years back, and since then he's been recognized by being a CNN Hero of the Year. He's also been um, recognized by the Disney Foundation on his efforts, and basically he just had this idea of why can't I start to grow some of these corals, and he started um, experimenting just like any scientist would of, of trying to grow them, and so he, he came up with that system of the trees. He has huge nurseries, even beyond what we do at Aquarius, he has acres and acres of nurseries where he's growing these trees. What his, what his mission is is to teach other people and other governments and other countries how to do this, and so he's now expanded into the Caribbean, all kinds of places in the Caribbean. He's expanding into the Pacific. Um, and so he's teaching people how to do this so that they can grow their own corals um, from these tiny little fragments. And so one or two pieces become many and, and plant those out on the reef to help grow the reef, um, places where it may be endangered species or, or, or need to help. He's really grown it into a great project and is a great partner for NEMO for what we what we do with him, but also his organization. And the oceans and that world and the reefs are so important, a very important part of our Earth and our entire uh, ecosystem. So, um, so that's awesome. So Trevor, here's another question from sure. Anastasi in uh, Arizona. They're wondering, do you ever study, aside from the coral, do you ever study the sea life outside the habitat, or do you ever connect with the sea life? <laughs> <laughs> there is some fascinating sea life outside the habitat. One of the few things I can think about right off the bat are the barracuda. There's always barracuda out there. They're very inquisitive animals. And then even bigger than the barracuda are these huge groupers, the size, you know, of uh, five, six feet long, huge groupers out there that are always hanging around the habitat. There are sometimes sharks. There was actually the habitat runs a specific um, mission where these people, uh, other scientists not associated with NEMO, go study the sharks um, and how they are, uh, how they're progressing in in the in the Florida Keys. And so that's a very fascinating mission. NEMO doesn't hasn't turned specifically to any organisms other than the corals themselves are organisms and and part of a life system. So w what we're really concentrating on is the science of those corals, um, but there's all kinds of sea life around and uh, other other organizations using Aquarius study that is study some of that aspects. I wouldn't want to necessarily run into a shark if I was out there doing a part of an EVA, but hopefully they don't come around too often. So here's another question from Immaculate Conception Catholic School here in Denton, Texas. They're wondering, and they've got sort of a, a couple of part question. One is, where was this underwater research facility made and how long did it take to get set up um, in this current location? Uh, so I'll, I'll start with those before I go into the other part of their question. Sure. Um, the Habitat was made by a submarine company. I believe it was in either North or South Carolina. Um, and it was built uh, in the late 90s. And actually the first place it went was not the Florida Keys. It actually went, I believe, to either Puerto Rico or um, Bahamas. And that was its first, it might have been, I'm not remembering exactly where its first location was, um, but it was someplace out in the Caribbean and then it was moved um, 
from that location to another location off the coast of North Carolina, and it was run by the University of North Carolina Wilmington for a while. And then finally, in 2000, in the late 90s or early 2000s, it was moved to the Florida Keys where it rests today. So the habitat has actually been in three different locations studying different types of sea life and different types of environments. You can imagine like off the coast of North Carolina, that's more of a colder water environment. So different sea life there, different types of things to study. And now it resides at, in, um, off the Florida Keys probably for the past 15 years or so. And you mentioned, Trevor, this is the only underwater research center. Uh, were there others? Why, are the, why is this now the only one that's left? Yeah, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of underwater habitat um, because it was a big push just like it was back in the 60s and 70s for, you know, the, the lunar surface. And there was a lot of interest in the resources that the ocean provided us. And so the Navy was experimenting in a lot of habitats, other countries. Um, had a lot of habitats. You can also imagine that that was back during the time of Jacques Cousteau doing a lot of things with the French government with underwater habitats. So incredible history back then. Um, and it's kind of dwindled off and now Aquarius is this only remaining undersea um, laboratory to do these types of, uh, of studies. You can imagine it's, you know, it's a challenge to keep something like this up and running because of what, you know, the earlier question is about corrosion and things like that. They do an incredible job doing that at Aquarius, keeping it up and running and have, and have really stood out as being the only ones left that have a habitat like this and keep it running year after year. Incredible feat and incredible facility. And we learn a lot from it doing these NEMO missions, I'm sure. So. Um, so Northern Cass is wondering, how long do the scientists stay down at this underwater research laboratory? And, um, you know, does it vary from a NEMO mission to other missions? How, how, how long is that in general? Yeah, great question. It's about, average is about 10 to 12 days. We've had longer missions of 14 and all the way up to 30 missions have occurred at Aquarius with, you know, scientists living down there for, for 30 days. For NEMO, the average is about 10 to 12 days. Um, awesome. Great so, question. Yeah, two weeks in the small little uh, confines of the Aquarius habitat. Yeah. Uh, I guess you leave your phone at home maybe. <laughs> yeah, you get to know your, your fellow aquanauts very, very closely. Awesome. Well, here's an interesting question from Anasazi. Have you ever or the Aquarius ever dealt with water leaks? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, they, they have, like I said, run this thing like a very tight ship. Um, a lot of guys, the former Navy that run the Aquarius habitat and very few, if any, water leaks. They're, they're, they have equipment that monitor that type of thing and are on it on, you know, very quickly. And it's a pressurized system, so it's always pushing air out in order to maintain um, its integrity and being dry inside. So that brings up an interesting question. You showed uh, the folks on the line the wet porch where it seems like you've got this habitat with just this opening open to the sea. Why doesn't the water fill up the habitat? It's pressurized. Like I said, you know, it's, a, it's, it's pressurized to the, the, the pressure of the outside water. So it basically keeps a steady state and that's what allows the easy access for the aquanauts to go diving outside the wet porch um, at any time. And that's, that's really the advantage of a habitat like this is because it allows you easy access to the ocean. Anytime you want to go out that wet porch, you can go exploring. Awesome. So here's a question from Lynn Haven, and they're actually in Florida. They, they said, you may have said this before, but they've been kind of um, on and off with the, with the phone line. They're wondering, uh, how deep again is, is Aquarius um, beneath the sea? Yeah, the sea floor at Aquarius is at 62 feet, so the sand. Um, it sits on a leg that raises it up a little bit. So actually where I showed that wet porch, if you were able to be on at that time, that wet porch where the, the, where the actual people live inside the habitat is right around 50 feet. So the sand is at 62, but the actual habitat is right around 50. So in that range is where a lot of the work gets done. 
but the aquanauts can actually go a lot deeper. So when they go out on these exploration or these EVAs, they can go down to like 100 feet easily to do more kind of coral studies. And that's, that really gives you a lot of advantage over topside diving, like somebody on a scuba tank, um, because they can only stay down there for short durations at that type of depth. The aquanauts can stay down there for four or five hours and work and, and do science at those deep depths, which is the type of research that we're really interested in, of like how these corals survive at those depth, deep depths. So great question, and that's, that's the advantage of the habitat is those long duration, um, deeper dives. Now you talk about these EVAs, and we notice in this picture that's shown on the screen that these people here are not wearing that sort of helmet hard hat type of thing. And you showed some other photos, I believe, that had people in these uh, sort of hatted types of suits. W what's the difference uh, between those two? Yeah, these these people. This was the crew of. Nemo 21, as they were taking their first dives, like we did, you know, we took our dive down to Aquarius, this was them going down on scuba tank or um, open circuit scuba tank. So they're, they're breathing, you know, they have a tank on their back, they're breathing through their regulators, um, masked in, snorkel type of thing. So they're, this is on their way down, took an opportunistic picture on their way in. You see the two hab techs in the window. Those are the guys that live in there with you. Um, so that's, that's them on their way in. Everything they did during that mission from there on out is with those big helmets on or the, the commercial dive helmets where you're attached to umbilical so you don't have the tanks and everything, um, but you're attached and getting all your breathing air through the umbilical that attaches back to the habitat. So you have 600 foot of umbilical and can go out exploring with those commercial dive helmets on. And it also gives you a very similar feel, you know, the aquanauts and the, the astronauts that have flown, say it gives you a very similar feel as an EVA around the space station, for example, because you have this helmet, you have a limited view out your helmet visor or your, your, your front visor of your helmet, very similar to what the spacewalk is on ISS or the International Space Center. And of course, while you're on the International Space Station, you are tethered, just like you're tethered in this case, so that you can have, uh, so you don't get lost, I guess, and so that you can maintain the, the, the needs you have while you're on that EVA. Exactly. All your comms go back through that tether, and so that's how you communicate when you're out there. Because you can imagine on scuba like this, you don't really have good communication. Hand signals is about the best that scuba divers have come up with to talk to each other or write things on slate. Um, but whenever you wear that big commercial dive helmet, you can talk away and the people that are controlling the operation from inside the HAB or back at Mission Control, they can talk to you just freely um, in conversation because that inside that helmet is all the communication tools you need. And I'm sure that's very important. And you know, it kind of leads us to one of the questions we had from Anasazi in terms of challenges. What have been some of the most difficult challenges as part of a NEMO mission, and how do you deal with those challenges? Hmm, great question. Um, a lot of the challenges that we have, especially when we go out EVA, is making sure that those umbilicals we talked about don't get all tangled up. So you have to keep in mind of where your buddy is so you don't create this big knot of your umbilical behind you. Same type of things that they worry about on ISS. They, they are very cognizant of what they call umbilical management or, you know, the, their tether management so that uh, that doesn't become a problem. Um, but other than that, no huge problems during um, any kind of NEMO missions. They've all gone off safely and efficiently. And uh, it's just the operations piece is always, you know, once you get that in place, it always rolls very efficiently. Awesome. So oh, here's one, one other thought on that. So one of the big challenges that come to mind as well is robotics and, and having robotics and equipment live in the seafloor environment is, is, you know, not always easy and because electronics and water always don't mix very easily. So we always are, you know, thinking of ways to, to keep our equipment, you know, up and working and using robotics and other type of things. That could be a challenge as well, but we've, we've kind of figured it out over the years. So even when you're drilling a coral, are you actually using a, 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 a drill that can mechanically work underwater? Yeah, all those things need to be considered. We can either use, you know, air systems or electrical systems, and all that has to be weighed, the pros and cons, in order to, to work and, and, and live under the water like we do. And 
fascinating. Well, here's a question, especially around lunchtime. Palm Springs North Elementary is wondering, what do you eat when you're underwater? And how do you get your food and such? You don't go fishing, do you? No, that's a, a lot of the food comes down in those pots that I showed and sitting in the wet porch. So a lot of that stuff comes down from topside down to the habitat. Um, a lot of it's kind of like camping food. So, you know, dehydrated food that you would get eat during camping or long backpacking trips. A lot of snacks that, that the astronauts or the aquanauts always say that, you know, that it, constantly snacking down there because you're, you're hungry on the work that you're doing and stuff like that. So a lot of snacks, a lot of dehydrated food. And just picture, you know, a long camping trip and the type of food you would eat during that. And that's essentially what they eat during their Aquarius or Nemo mission. Awesome. Now, Chester High School uh, asked an interesting question. They've been studying ocean currents. And they're wondering, is this anything that you get a chance to do as a part of NEMO, or do you even have to deal with ocean currents during NEMO missions? Yeah, the, the, the currents are definitely um, changing all the time out there, and the, the divers have to be cognizant of the currents. Um, sometimes you get some really strong currents that can be some challenges. Um, going back to that previous question, that you know, the environment can throw you some challenges with currents and you know, the water temperatures and things like that. There is a long-term um, station at, outside Aquarius, maybe about a football field away or so, um, that, that studies the ocean currents, and it's always sending data back and recording that um, just, just off of Aquarius, and aquanauts can go there and, and service that equipment. And so they're doing a long-term current study um, at Aquarius. Interesting. Great question, Chester High School. Absolutely. Now, um, it is almost the top of the hour. Trevor, are you able to spend a few more minutes with a few additional questions that we might have in? Sure, these are great questions. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, for, for, since it is the top of the hour, for those of you that may have to depart, um, thank you so much for taking the time, especially towards this end of the school year where I know things can be awfully crazy and graduations and ceremonies and all that type of thing, but we're so glad that you took the time to join us today. And again, I want to thank Trevor for taking the time to share his expertise. And again, stay tuned, teachers, because I will be sending out information about um, potentially connecting from down under while a mission is going on in June. So stay tuned. Hopefully, we can do that as well. If you are able to stay on the line, I'd love to be able to answer these additional questions that are here. So, But if not, have a great summer to those of you that might be departing, and we'll connect with you again soon. So back to you, Trevor, some sure. additional questions. Um, you know, Anastasi has asked a couple of really interesting questions, and, and one of them is, how do you handle illness? I mean, I'm sure this is the type of thing that uh, the International Space Station has to deal with as well, but even in NEMO in the confined environment, how do you deal with the fact that someone gets sick? Yeah, so I, I mentioned a lot about science and engineers, but there's also medical people that are involved in this. So there's always a Navy medical doctors on standby um, that can come down in the HAB because, you know, the crew can't just come out of the HAB and come back to the surface at any time. That's kind of what makes it the extreme mission that it is. Um, and so, there's medical perso personnel always standing by. A lot of times there's a medical person on the crew itself and, and down there in the HAB during the whole, the whole mission. So there's always standby medical facility and, you know, they, they run a really great operation there that, that takes all that into account. Awesome. Um, so this is somewhat related to health in the sense of, uh, again, from Anasazi, how long can you stay down underwater with an oxygen tank? How long can the crew stay underwater on an EVA where they're hatted? Can you talk a little to that? Sure. So your regular scuba just isn't, it's not oxygen, it's, it's just like air. So, you know, it's 21% oxygen and the rest nitrogen type of thing inside your scuba tank. You can play with those mixtures a little bit that may let you stay down a little bit longer but um, that's normal scuba diving. It depends on depth a little bit, so let's pick a depth that's like uh, 100 feet. So that's like the deep, deep as you can go on scuba diving uh, is around in that range. A person on scuba diving that can go down there can maybe work about 20 minutes max 
um, on 100 feet on normal air tank. An aquanaut can go down to 100 feet wearing those commercial masks that I, I showed you in the pictures on the umbilicals, diving, you know, getting their air from the habitat. They can spend four hours, five hours um, working at that depth. Um, so that's really the advantage of this, this, this type of diving and the type of operation that they run from Aquarius. So that really extends that time um, that you can safely work at, at, at deeper depths like that. Shallower depth, the scuba can maybe last you 40, 40 minutes, maybe an hour max at like at 40 or 50 feet. And the aquanauts can indefinitely stay if they needed. I mean, the biggest. The biggest concern there is that eventually they got to get back inside to eat and maybe warm up and things like that. But uh, great question. Yeah, it's really interesting. And scuba diving is a recreational activity that is so amazing and so great. And it, in a sense, uh, enables you to feel what it might be like floating in space. However, the work that you guys do, you guys and gals do as part of NEMO, is not just sort of hanging out and enjoying weightlessness, so to speak. You're truly living and working in this extreme environment. So um, uh, very important differences there. Recreational diving is awesome. Nemo has its own awesomeness associated with it as well. So Immaculate Conception Catholic School has a question, and this is a good one. What happens during a bad storm? Has Nemo ever had a hurricane that's come through? What do you do in those types of instances? Yeah, uh, Nemo 17, I want to say, a hurricane was headed our way before the mission started, um, and so it was delayed um, and rescheduled. But those are the types of things you got to keep an eye out for. And so luckily with hurricanes, you at least get a little bit of, of, of warning a couple days out on what the hurricane track is going to be. Um, so those are the things people are constantly keeping an eye on. Um, if it's just a bad weather day, that's another advantage of doing the type of diving from the habitat and the habitat itself. Is you don't know what's going on topside. It could be raining, lightning, storming. And you can go about your work because you're completely isolated from that. The topside divers may not be able to get out, or the boats may it may be too wavy or current, too much current for the divers or the boats um, to come out. But the aquanauts inside the HAV can go out and do work um, because they're isolated from the storm, you know, um, that's going on the surface. If there is a hurricane coming um, and the aquanauts are down there, then they it, they they you know, may end the mission earlier and bring them up just because of the boat factors and things like that. Um, but great question. Yeah, that is a great question. And since this upcoming mission is in June and that's the early part of the hurricane season, hopefully uh, weather won't be a factor. But you you talked about that LSD, that big four inch uh, that that connects the item on the on the the buoy that connects all sort of the uh, the needs for the habitat down below. If there's a whole lot of waves and 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 such on the surface, does that affect uh, the what gets down to the habitat or the communications or anything like that? It can affect the communication. The the cable itself that connects the LSB to the habitat is is, is strain relief. So it you know the, the LSB is held in place and there's enough cable that allows that to flex and 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 move with the ocean waves. Um, the waves itself can actually be a problem sometimes with the communication. If that LSB is really swinging back and forth, you, you're trying to line up a microwave, you know, communication back and forth between shore and the LSB. And if something's swinging like this, it can become a challenge. But very much like space flight, you you know, you sometimes lose comms. Uh, communication sometimes is a challenge because of aligning you know, these dishes that need to talk to each other, kind of like your wireless, you know, router at home, you know, you may find places where the comm drops out, you know, worse in some room versus other. Um, but yeah, that, that's always a, a something we keep in mind is the communication and, you know, the weather, the LSB conditions. And you can see why it becomes really challenging. There's a lot of things moving pieces, but it's very much like space flight in that regard. Awesome, and that's why it's an extreme environment, mission operations. Yeah, very apropos name. Here's a, a great question for visitors that might 
want to go to that area or be in that area, and this comes from Lynn Haven in Florida, can visitors in the Keys tour the workplace of NEMO? Um, it's not an open facility. Uh, there are some contacts on the, I would you know, encourage you to go to the FIU Aquarius page um, and look up some of the contacts there um, for the facility and contact out them and see what the options are. Um, during a NEMO mission, it's really busy and a lot of, um, a lot of people working there, um, so we don't actively do um, tours, but I know FIU has that, that facility um, during maybe some of their slower times, so I would, I, would, I would point you in that direction of the FIU Aquarius page. Now, the Coral Restoration Foundation, is there a place where they can visit and, and um, for that particular organization? Foundation? Yeah, again, I would, I would point you to the Coral Restoration Foundation page. They have always are doing outreach um, and they always are looking for volunteers to help with cleaning those corals. Um, so that's something that you'd have to get scuba dive for um, certified, um, but they're always looking for volunteers, either um, boats or with communications or just give a, a great tour of the types of things that they do. So. Um, Core Restoration Foundation is also right in that area, Key Largo, um, and so I, if you're in that area, definitely check them out and reach out to them. And do they do interns at the high school or college level interns? I believe it may be both at, the, at that level, and so there's high school opportunities and, and early college opportunities to get involved. Um, so if you're interested in marine science or engineering or that types of things or even communication, um, definitely keep those um, in mind for opportunities. Awesome. Now, I don't think I missed any other questions, but I'll give you a moment or two if you have any additional questions that you wanna uh, ask Trevor before we um, all take off for the rest of our days. But, you know, it's really interesting to think about um, uh, the, the parallels you would think underwater and dealing with corals, and I'm so glad, Trevor, that you talked about that slide of the connections to space exploration and how this, these types of missions really help provide great information for the future of space exploration, especially when we're thinking about sending humans to other places beyond low Earth orbit. And so these types of missions and the work that, that uh, you and the team are involved in are so very important, and it's so very exciting to be able to hear about this from you. So I think with that, I don't see any additional questions that have come in. So uh, for those of you that are still on the line, thank you for staying on the line with us, and thank you for your great questions. And again, Trevor, thank you so much for being able to share all that, that you've shared today about NASA NEMO with students from all around the nation. So I guess with that, we'll call it a day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Have a great summer and a great rest of your school year. And we hope to perhaps be able to connect with some of you perhaps in June or certainly again next year. So thanks again, everyone. With that, we're signing off. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.